Hello, I'm David Morley. I'm the director of the Warwick Prize for Writing, and today I have the great pleasure of welcoming Naomi Klein, who's the first winner of this prize with her book, The Shock Doctrine. Welcome, Naomi. First of all, congratulations on winning the inaugural Warwick Prize for Writing. How did you feel when you found out? I was really surprised <laughs> and, and thrilled. So first of all, I, I just want to thank you for this amazing honor. Uh, but but when, I, when I read the list of, of um, the other books, I, I thought, I'll never win that. So it came as a total surprise. Well, what are your perceptions about a university giving out uh, such a prize with such a wide remit to it? I love the idea of how, of how cross-disciplinary it is, and, and, uh, and it, it, it reminds me actually of a, a quote from Eduardo Galeano that um, he uses at the beginning of his Memories of Fire trilogy, where he explains why he won't classify his writing, and Galeano is one of my favorite mm -hmm. writers, and talks about why he won't classify the trilogy as, um, as, as, as history or journalism or mm. poetry or fiction, it's all of those things. Um, but he said he never respected the, the people who patrol the literary borders. <laughs> oh, no, okay. Yeah. And so I, I thought immediately of, of Galliano's um, uh, philosophy of, of, of defiantly crossing mm -hmm. those borders and tearing up his passport. And, uh, <laughs> but I think for, particularly for me, because I, I, um, the book is so controversial politically, that um, it, was, it was it it particularly meaningful to to have the writing recognized in this way because mm -hmm. I think so much of the discussion of the book focuses on um, whether or not you agree with the thesis and um, and, and so obviously I, I I I put a lot of work into into how I, I, I built that thesis and and I put a lot of work into the writing so it's lovely to have the writing recognized. This this book, from what I understood, took, took years and years of research. Can can you talk about how how that all came together? Hmm. Yeah, it did take years. It started, I started the research in, I suppose, 2001. I didn't know what, what the research was going to lead to. I wasn't consciously working on this particular project, but I started researching the connections between uh, free market ideology and violence. Uh, um, when I was living in Argentina making a documentary film and the war in Iraq began, and, and I learned about the history of how uh, the free market experiment began in Argentina, um, and it began, as they say, you know, with blood and fire. So it was the perspective of being in Latin America when the war in Iraq began, and lear simultaneously learning that violent history mm -hmm. of how the Chicago boys came to Chile and Argentina and Uruguay and Brazil and began this experiment that morphed into Thatcherism and Reaganism, and then seeing the violence repeat in Iraq and this particular, I would call it a Latin American lens through which I saw the Iraq War. You know, if you remember all those protests in the first year uh, to stop the invasion, they were simultaneous around the world. There were these extraordinary, extraordinarily global uh, events. And I was in Buenos Aires when, when, when that day of protest happened. So we went, our whole film crew went to the protest in Buenos Aires. And what people kept saying was, they're, they're doing it again. They did this to us and now they're doing it again. And so it was that lens, that perspective, which I never would have gotten had I been at the march in London or had I been at the, the march in Toronto where I live, um, that, that opened up this narrative to, to me. Um, but it just kept evolving and kept evolving and, and, and grew, I suppose, more ambitious in its scope because the thesis I started with um, was, is not the thesis I ended with. His thesis was changed by yeah, I was the gonna research. Ask, I was going to ask, were, 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 were you transformed yourself by, by, by the writing of the book? Yeah, absolutely. I was transformed um, in the sense that I, I really didn't plan. The, the thesis of the shock doctrine is, is, is a pretty radical thesis. You know, it's arguing that the, that the ideology of our time, which packages itself as being synonymous with freedom and democracy, fr uh, um, the fr free market ideology, um, has actually needed violence in order to advance, not just in its early laboratories, but in you know in Russia in the 90s, uh, you know in China, um, and uh, you know in, in Britain with with the attacks on the coal miners, and um, I had no intention of making that argument when I started. I, I intended to say it began with violence and it is now advancing through violence, but I didn't believe that the 80s and 90s were violent mm -hmm. periods. I, I understood that there had been violence, but I sort of bought the Cold War narrative. I didn't see the violence as being in service of the ideology. 
I think part of the reason why the book became more radical is because I wrote it in kind of isolation. Because uh, in order for me to kind of carve out space to write, uh, I need to isolate myself a little uh, bit. How did you do that? What's, what's your space? <laughs> well, I mean, I was actually, I moved from Toronto where I live uh, and where it's very hard for me to say no to things. And, you know, we're in, very close to New York and very close to, you know, it's just easy to, 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 to re-engage with every, with every issue. And um, when I wrote No Logo, my first book, it also took me a long time. But at that point, I was unknown and I didn't have many demands on my time and nobody really cared if I just sort of disappeared. But with this book, I really needed to carve out the space and say no to a lot of things. And eventually, I was just so bad at it that we, we moved from the city to um, a pretty remote part of British Columbia, Canada, a very um, beautiful part of Canada. Um, need to get there by ferry boat um, uh, or float plane and, and live there for two years uh, in a place where, you know, my, my husband was with me for about half the time. The other half of the time, my main company was, you know, deers. One time a bear <laughs> climbed uh, the tree above my office. And so, um, this, sounds I, like, this sounds like my kind of place. Yeah, it was a beautiful I, place. But I think it. because I wasn't in the media mix, mm -hmm. I was really on my own. I kind of lost track of what you were allowed to say mm -hmm. and what you weren't allowed to say, and I just sort of followed, followed the thesis where it took mm -hmm. me and came out at, on the other end. And people thought, told me that that was a really radical mm -hmm. thing to be saying. But that, that part of your life when you were unknown and you were writing your first book, um, obviously that's the situation in which most of the students who are here, who aspire to be writers, find themselves. Mm -hmm. From my recollection of that, that's a very enabling and interesting time. Uh, because nobody's really saying no or yes to you. You have to talk to yourself about it. Uh, how, how, yeah. what, what kind of advice would you have for uh, writers who are at that stage of their careers, with the first books coming through and the writing of that book and the finishing of it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, finishing is the key, right? Mm -hmm. what, whatever stage in your career you're at, it does require a d the delays of instant gratification. <laughs> um, and I think if you're at a later stage in your career, it's, you know, you're clear on what you're saying no to um, in order to, to be able to go deeper into a, into a subject. Um, but when you're beginning as well, I mean, you, you know, there's an instant gratification in seeing your byline published or you know, pu publishing a lot um, as opposed to waiting <laughs> um, and, and, and doing something that maybe will last longer, mm -hmm. be around for longer. Um, so you have to delay gratification, I suppose. And it's not a message people necessarily want to, to hear. But um, I mean, for, for me, I, I, I was very conscious of writing for a younger version of myself. And I think you, young mm -hmm. writers are in a particularly strong perspective of remembering mm -hmm. what they didn't know recently. <laughs> um, Whereas I think the older you get, the harder it is to remember what it's like actually not to, not, not to know what you know now and, and, uh, and to be in, in touch with what it really requires to write um, for, for a popular audience. I mean, mm. you can't assume too much knowledge. Um, you have to constantly uh, um, be finding fresh ways to say things. And I think we become more complacent as, as, mm. as we grow older. So I think young people, you know, remembering who, who you were when you were, you know, 18, who you were when you were 16, and what turned the light on for you, what made... Uh, you know, abstract ideas hit home um, and, you know, write for your younger self. And the further we get from that younger self, the harder that is to do. Yeah. So that's a real yes. asset. Yeah. So if you were to come uh, back uh, for a week at a British university such as this, uh, how might you use your time with the staff or the students or even members of the public? You know, I think of what I do as, as, as popular education and, and, and spend a lot of time speaking to university students. Um, but when I finished the Shock Doctrine, um, I, I work with a, a, an amazing um, research assistant named, named Deborah Levy. She's been working with me for almost eight years now. She wrote me a, a letter after she read No Logo, just the best letter I received from a reader. And I was so taken with it that we started corresponding. And then she went to library school. And she's a trained librarian. And she has, has, um, has been working with me ever, ever since. But because she comes from that background, she's actually a children's librarian, and her husband uh, Kyle Yamada is a high school teacher. We're always talking about how we can take this material and um, and make it accessible to young people. Mm -hmm. It's really important to us. And so when we finished the book, um, we d designed the website. Um, we, and amongst ourselves, we call it the shock course, 
which is a little grim. Um, but, but the idea is to, to open up the research process, and, and we put as many of the original source materials um, that, that transformed my thinking online. Uh, uh, so, you know, read Milton Friedman's letters to Pinochet and Pinochet's letters mm -hmm. back, and you decide for yourself what was going on there, you know, um, and, and read these, the declassified interrogation manuals, CIA interrogation manuals, and all kinds of fantastic source materials. So I think what I would do is, is, is teach the shock, you know, teach the shock course with, with those original documents. There's a couple of documents that really um, well, there's these two letters in particular. One is um, by an Argentinian writer, um, uh, an open letter uh, to the military m military junta. Um, th that that was the f the document that I read when I was in Argentina in 2002. That connects um, torture with the 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 imposition of free market po uh, policies that sort of turned the light on for me. And I would it's, it's something that you know. It's barely read in English. I would love for people to read that. Also, Orlando Letelier's last essay, um, where he connects these issues. That was an, another really key document. So I'd love to teach these mm -hmm. and, and just get other people's reactions to them. Sounds great. Um, we're going to finish soon now, but um, uh, can I just say uh, con my warmest con congratulations. And it's been a great prize to, to organize. And I was delighted when I found out that you were the winner. Thank you, David. No, no thank I you. I as well.